turning in the word of God to the passage that was read from Mark's gospel, that's the seventh chapter, and those verses at the end of the chapter, verses 31 down to the end, verse 37, where we have the account of the healing of the deaf and the dumb man. Now, our Lord's ministry in this uh, situation is taking place in what is described here as the coasts of Decapolis. And we might just say by way of introduction that our Lord's ministry begins very much in the region of Galilee. And Mark has traced out uh, how that ministry has progressed. There have been many miracles performed, many mighty works have been done. And then he tells us how our Lord tirelessly as he was in laboring for the good of man's soul and salvation. He then makes his way northwards up to the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, some 40 miles or more further north uh, into the territory that was really part of the promised land, but at this time, as which we're speaking of here, was mainly occupied by the Gentiles. And we mentioned that in passing, that he goes there, and it is a kind of a foretaste and an anticipation of the gospel spreading throughout the wide world. And when we preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is a universal gospel. It is a gospel that is suited, that can be applied. It's relevant to every man and woman's case in the wide world. One of the hymns says, suited to every sinner's case. And so it's a picture of that, our Lord making this wider ministry. Now, in this instance that's before us now, he's coming into these, as we say, the coasts of Decapolis. And if you're those that like to have a, a picture of where something's taking place, you might imagine the Sea of Galilee, and this is happening to the east of the Sea of Galilee and somewhat to the south. And again, it's an area of the country that was very much occupied by the, the Romans, who you know had occupied Palestine at that time. And our Lord is, in, in this case, making his way back southwards. But it's taking him a long time because he has a purpose of being away from where people knew him too much. Our Lord always has a purpose in what he's doing. And it's a wonderful thing to have a purpose in life. And every single Christian man or woman has a great purpose in life, whatever they're doing, even if they're only traveling from A to B. And our Lord was in these more remote regions, not only for the good of men's souls and for the good of those on whom he performs these mighty miracles, which we'll come to in a minute. But he's also using these, this time away from the crowds and away from the press, uh, people wanting his attention at every moment, to train up his disciples. He's coming to the last year of his earthly ministry. The scribes and the Pharisees and all those who are hostile to him are becoming more hostile. They're making life with their carping criticisms and their petty criticisms difficult for him. And he, in effect, departs from them. By the way, you know where people are and have that sort of attitude to the things of God. It causes the Savior, in many respects, to depart from them. Anyway, he departed from that carping criticism. But he goes into these remote regions that he might have time to teach his disciples, to prepare them for the time when he ascended back into heaven and left them with the responsibility of teaching and preaching and continuing the work of the gospel. And it's not without significance that when he does return from this long trip away, he says to the disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? Uh, and, and, and they reply, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elias or Elijah, 
Some say this and some say the other. And then he says, And whom do you say that I am? And Peter, always in the forefront, says this, Thou art the Christ. The lesson had been learned. And so when we come to these things today, this is the background uh, of what is going on. So we, we come to these coasts of Decapolis. He wasn't known, except he was known somewhat, because there had been a missionary there before him. You remember the Gadarene demoniac. Our Lord had just touched on these shores. He just for a short time entered this region and performed that mighty miracle and brought that man back to his senses, if you like. And it is coming back to our senses when we come to know Christ as our Savior and God as our King and our Lord. But he said to that, to that man, he, he said uh, when he departed uh, to go and publish in Decapolis the great things that the Lord had done for him. And he did his work. And so, though our Lord had never really been much in that region, some knew about him. A preparatory work had been done. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name. That's a responsibility of all true believers. Now, let's come then to this miracle. And first of all, to the man who is the subject of the miracle. It says in verse 32, And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. Now, it's, it's needless to say that deafness is a very trying handicap. In life, there are many things that can come to us that are difficult. We sometimes compare deafness with blindness. We may think which one of those is the most difficult to cope with. But of all the things that can come to us in life, we know that deafness is a very serious and very hard thing with which to cope. This man, in these circumstances here, he, he was cut off from his fellow men. There was a sense in which his handicap would put him into a kind of a solitary confinement of life. He could neither receive communication from the outside world, and it was exceedingly difficult for him, likewise, to communicate with the outside world. It was an exceedingly great difficulty that he was encountering. A very well-known sufferer from deafness in the 19th century, you may have heard of him, I'm sure, it was John Kitto. He was famous for Kitto's daily Bible illustrations and that uh, amazing encyclopedia of biblical knowledge. And I mention him for two reasons. One, he described deafness very, very tenderly and poignantly. He, he said this, To me, the whole world is dumb since I am dead to it. No more the music of the human voice shall charm. All around, below, and above is a solitary silence, ever-enduring silence, stillness unbroken. It just puts us into the picture a little bit, doesn't it? Those of us who are not deaf. But for Kitto, though I mustn't go off at a tangent, his deafness was a blessing. He was a poor boy, said to work mending roofs. He had no education, poor family, no real prospects in life, but he fell off a roof which made him deaf. And someone took him in and educated him, used him, found he was a genius, really. And so his life was blessed, even through his handicap. But anyway, we're looking at this deafness here, of course, as a picture of the gospel. The sinner's case and the gospel remedy for that situation. We know all the miracles are parables, 
They're all teaching. They're all there to illustrate what happens to a man or woman when the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ lays hold on them. And so we're looking at it in this situation. Physical deafness here is a picture of spiritual deafness. Uh, There are many people who are deaf, and yet spiritually their perception, their spiritual perception is very, very keen. And there are others who are not physically deaf, and their spiritual perception or hearing is virtually nil. And those of us who are true Christians here this evening and have passed through the conversion experience, we know there was that time when we were deaf and we couldn't hear. We couldn't hear anything of spiritual things at all. The hymn writer talks about we couldn't hear the the thrilling music of thy voice. And you may be here tonight. And the thrilling music, because it is that, of the sound of the gospel, of the message of salvation, you are deaf to it. And this man also was dumb. He could not express the thoughts of his heart. And you know, all men are made in the image and likeness of God. Our highest blessing and boon is to know God and enjoy him forever, to hold communion, fellowship, dialogue, if you like, with God. And if you're one of these spiritually deaf and dumb individuals, you can't hear the thrilling music, the life-giving music of the voice of God, and you cannot respond to it. You cannot Give God the praises that he alone is worthy of and find the end and the the glorious fulfillments for which you were made. So it is a very serious thing to be spiritually deaf and spiritually dumb. We might say physical deafness requires our understanding, our sensitivity, our sympathy. But spiritual deafness is really something to be condemned. Or you could say it was something to be pitied in a great way because it is a pitiful thing for someone to be spiritually deaf and spiritually dumb. Now, we could think about how this particularly relates to the times, the times, the period in which we live. Now, I don't know whether to read this or just to summarize it, but I'll read a bit of it. Somebody said this. The benefits of our modern world are obvious and innumerable. Well, nobody would argue with that, would they? The benefits of the age, the period in which we live, are obvious and innumerable. And this modern world, in many respects, has liberated us and opened up to us vistas and opportunities in the realm of education and experience far greater in many respects than anything that our forebears ever experienced or knew about. We have, generally speaking, a greater prosperity than they ever had. And many, many doors are open to us that were closed to them. But on the other hand, Our modern world has also laid upon us a great cost. It has cost us a great deal, and usually in spiritual things. I read again. Modernization, if you like, the modern world has blighted our lives by cutting off our connections, place, community. It's elevated our level of anxiety, has it not? It has greatly diminished our satisfaction with our jobs. It has uh, spawned a pervasive fear. They call it the age of anxiety, don't they? It has also spawned discontent. How many people are truly content in life with their lot? It has contributed to the breakdown of the family. 
It's robbed, in many cases, our children of their childhood or their innocency. And it has certainly diluted and watered down our ethical senses and sensitivities. And it has, more than anything else you might say, made us deaf, and this is the root of it really, deaf to the voice of God. You know, the voice of God is an animating voice. The voice of God is a, a life-giving voice. The, li- the, the, the voice of God is a thrilling voice. And the age and our own sinful hearts have made us deaf to that voice. And, and it's the same thing in regard to spiritual dumbness. You can experience it yourself, either from your own experience, in your own self or in others, I mean. You can talk to somebody on almost any subject. It might be money, it might be sports, it might be politics, it might be pleasures, and our own voice. Very often we find ourselves doing it, or the other person's voice, their, their conversation flows, the words flood out. But turn that conversation to the things of God, the things of heaven, the things of the Spirit, the matter of life and death and salvation. And those words, well, they don't flow at all. There is a dumbness that can easily envelop us, for which we have to be careful of. And we see it so so often in, in the world. You go try and talk to somebody tomorrow. They say, did you have a good weekend? And you say, I went to church. I went to the Metropolitan Tabernacle. I dare say it will kill the conversation dead unless the Lord is with you and gives you the words to say. Some people are very good at that. And if you've got that gift, use it. But you know what I mean. The hymn writer says, Lord, I was dumb. I could not speak the grace and glory of thy name. So many of us were like that. And sadly, to a certain degree, we're still like that sometime. Now, when the tongue is unloosed, you think of the Apostle Paul again that we were speaking of this morning. They said, to him, said about him, Behold, he prays. There was the loosening of the tongue and the, the real evidence of it. Behold, he prays. And you can often tell a person's condition, spiritual condition, by that, that gauge, that register of prayer. You can tell whether we're in the faith or not by the level of our praying, the, the state of our prayer life. Behold, he prays. It was a sign that his tongue was unloosed. Another sign is this. When we instinctively cry out with words similar to this or, similar, or exactly the same as this, when we cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's one of the first evidences that that person, man or woman, boy or girl, has become spiritually alive. Their ears have been unstopped. Their tongue has been loosed. I'm going to give you another quotation that was said about 50 or 60 years ago. And it said this. It said, there are few dangers threatening the religious future more seriously than the slow shallowing of the religious minds. Think about that. There are few dangers about today more serious than the slow shallowing of the religious mind. The same quotation says, safety is in the deep, in the deep things of God, in exercising the mind to think deeply and seriously and thoroughly on spiritual subjects. 
And the quotation goes on and says, the lazy cry for simplicity and are appalled by being asked to think about the great things of God or the great concepts of life or the great realities of existence, life and death and so on. Well, that is a characteristic of the age. It's an age where there is sound, where there is noise, a cacophony of noise, all around us, all the time. And it seems to have the effect of making us deaf to the voice of God. We can't concentrate on big matters. We can't take in eternal issues. We can't pause for a while and ask, is it well with my soul? In the days of the Lancashire cotton industry, the world I grew up in, most of the women were deaf because they worked amongst the clatter of the looms day after day after day after day. Clatter, clatter, noise, noise, noise. And after that, they couldn't hear anything. And it's like that today. The deafness of the modern world. One of the Christmas carols says, Oh, hush, ye noise, ye men of strife, and hear the angels sing. Well, we don't hear the angels sing. We don't hear the voice of God. We're too busy. We're too tired, we're too weary, we're too deaf to these things. So deafness and dumbness here. But then what about the man's cure? Well, it says, first of all, that our Lord took him aside, verse 33, and he took him aside from the multitudes. Well, the teaching of that is, is obvious, isn't it? I don't want to tell you things that are obvious, too many things that are obvious, but... He took him aside. There are times when the Lord does that to us, you know. Again, the conversion experience. Sometimes, in some cases, comes out of a time of sickness. It can come out of a time of bereavement. It can come out of a time of job loss. It can come out of some crisis in life when in one way or the other, the Lord takes us on one side and says, stop, think, take stock. Is this world's empty glory costing me too dear? That sort of a thing. And it takes him on one side. Now, you know, I don't go into the subject, but it touches on the Sabbath, doesn't it? What has the Lord done for every single one of us here this evening, at this present hour? He has, by his gracious spirit, drawn us into this place. He has, as it were, taken us aside unto himself, where we may sit, and and we may consider, and we may hear the life-giving words of God. It's a wonderful thing, you know, to keep the Sabbath day holy. It's part of God's blessing to mankind, it's part, some say it's part of the rhythm of life. Uh, and it is. There's a rhythm in the, in the seasons. There's a rhythm in the night and the day and so on. There's a r- rhythm in life's experience. There is a pattern in the weeks and the days. And one day in seven we come aside. And we remind ourselves that This world isn't all. The material things aren't everything. That success in this and success in that, though it may be sweet and pleasant and something to be sought after, is not the real purpose of life. We come aside and we take stock. So our Lord, he takes this man. It's a pagan region that he's living in, really. It's the region of Decapolis, as we said. It's not easy in the midst of unbelief to to take stock. But the Lord brought this man to that place and to that situation and that circumstance. 
the method that our Lord uses is very unusual, you may say. The man, by the way, wants him to put his hand upon him and give him back his hearing and, and uh, his speech and so on. It's amazing how often our Lord, just by the way he heals with a touch, all might, majesty, dominion and power belong to him. He may not heal with a touch, he may heal with a word or whatever. But he often healed with a touch and this man had heard of that. He heard that Jesus saves and he wanted that experience for himself. Anyway, in verse 33 it says, he, put, he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. What are we to make of that? Can we say this? That our Lord was speaking to this man in a way that he, he could take in. We believe this, do we not? Faith. We're saved by grace through faith. Through faith. Had this man got faith, how is he going to hear about faith if he's deaf? How is this faith going to be kindled in his soul? Our oh Lord does it as it were by a sign. He puts his fingers into the man's ear as if he is saying to this man, I am and can unblock your ears. Believe me, this is what I am doing now to you. Believe these things and you shall receive your hearing again. It was the way that the man could take it in. And then there is the, the use of the spit or the of a spit. What can you say of that? It's th there is another occasion further on in the same gospel where our Lord does a similar thing. And they will tell you that it has to do with our Lord's mouth, which again is a symbolic way of reminding us that it is the power of the spoken word of God. Oh, Faith comes by hearing. But what if the man cannot hear? Our Lord has many ways of communicating and bringing that truth of his word to men and women. And he does it in this case, along that way. But it keeps coming back to the same principle. There is wonderful power in God speaking. After all, he spake and the worlds were made. He commanded, and everything was so. We sing sometimes of the wonderful words of life. This man was saved by God's grace coming to him in this wonderful way through the power of our Savior Jesus Christ, the living words. So we could say that about the unusual approach that he has to this man. But then we can't miss out. We can't possibly miss out verse, verse 34. And looking up to heaven. And looking up to heaven. What significance is in that? What light? What truth is in that little expression? And looking up to heaven. The upward look. What did our Lord receive when he looked upwards? He already had the power to do these things, these miracles, because he is divine. But it shows something of the harmony that exists between the persons of the Trinity. And, and it's a, a lesson to us to look up. We can't do anything without the upward look, can we? You've heard this a thousand times before. But the prayer meeting is essential, as is private prayer, in the life of the individual Christian and the life of every church. The minister can't preach. 
unless there is the upward look of the church behind him. The minister can't preach unless there is the calling down of the power and enabling power of the Holy Spirit upon him. The upward look. Isn't it interesting also that the acts of mercy and the upward look go together? The upward look, the act of mercy, the act of mercy, the upward look intimately connects it. Some people say the world, or certainly our society, is becoming more cruel. It is becoming more self-centered. It is becoming more unkind. It is becoming less generous. You could go on. And why? There has been a disconnect between our life and the life of heaven, the upward look has been neglected. It's the upward look that breathes, that enables, that gives the spirit of compassion and the tenderness that our Lord was expressing here. Yes, he already had it, but he takes another glance, as it were, breathes in the air of heaven, takes another glimpse of his father's face, to enable him to do this, this mighty, mighty work, the upward look. We all need, on a regular basis, to refresh our vision of heaven. As you go through this life, and through this week, with all its pressures, don't neglect the upward look. Don't, sometimes it only takes a moment. But take stock and give the upward look. It's the source of all our might. It's the source, in a sense, of all our happiness. We were made for God. And if we're not in fellowship with him, we will never and can never possibly be happy ever again. The upward look will guard you from those sudden temptations those sudden impulses to say an unkind word, that sudden failing of our inner character that sends us on the wrong track. Keep on looking upwards. Our Lord here sets us a wonderful example. And then there's something else as well as we draw to a close. The upward look, the source of his strength. The upward look, the source of his compassion. And it's no sooner spoken of the upward look than our Lord breathes that sigh. Verse 34. And looking upward to heaven, he sighed. He sighed. He's moved at the misery of man. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? That there is one who is moved at the misery of of man. But it's connected with the upward look. The two things go together. Somebody said that our Lord sighed for another reason. Some say, some have said that he sighed because he knew what men had done with the hearing of their ears and the conversation from their tongues. Think of that. He sighed because he realized or knew how men had misused the wonderful gift of hearing and the wonderful gift of speech and communication. That makes us think, doesn't it? Are we guilty? What about our words as we go into this week? Are they going to be wonderful words of life and encouragements and so on? Or is it going to be gossip? Tale telling, criticism, negativism, and so on. And what about our hearing? What shall we hear? We hear lots of things in this modern world. But do we give ourselves to listening to the voice of God? So he sighs. And then he says these words in Aramaic, which the commentators remind us is, is an evidence of. Um, Witness, you know, present witness, somebody who really saw these things. 
first-hand evidence witness, Epapha. Be opened. Be opened. He speaks, and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful, broken hearts rejoice. The humble poor believe. Has the Lord spoken? His be opened to your hearts. Has, has it come home to you and me that here we are in this world, deaf to the things of God, dumb to his praise, missing out on the real music of the voice of God, missing the whole point and purpose of life and, and grubbing around uh, in the world of sin and selfishness and missing the real essence of life. Be opened, hear, listen, respond, trust, call on Christ to be your Savior, your King, and your Lord, and speak forth his praise and find the end and purpose of your being. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, your loosened tongues implore, ye blind, behold, your Savior come. And leap ye lame for joy. And straightway his ears were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. May the Lord bless us. May some, some come home tonight and find these things to be true. God bless each one.